Let's talk a little bit about health care because it is, according to statistics, the number one driver of consumer debt and national debt. Fraud, yeah, it's there. And waste, yeah, it's there. But there may be a way to somewhat ameliorate some of that. And what you're talking about here is the role of AI in management of our health care system. Dr. Severance M. McLaughlin is a globally recognized expert in artificial intelligence, data science, blockchain technology. He advises Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and more, and is with us to talk a little bit more about the role of AI in the issue of health care and health care management. Dr. McLaughlin, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, look forward to having this conversation, which I think is... Uh is uh, apropos for the moment, if you will. I am so out of it when it comes to understanding what AI is all about, but clearly everyone knows we've heard a lot about fraud and we've heard a lot about waste and we've heard a lot about abuse. And whether we like it or not, things are going to have to change, I think is part of what you're looking at, correct? Absolutely. I, I think when you're, when you're looking at what the government's looking to do with our health care payers, specifically the government, there, there's an opportunity to, to trim some of the fat off and, and some of, and exactly that comes through fraud, waste, and abuse. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot there. But using AI to do that allows more of a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer so that the recipients of the care are not affected, if you will. I think we're all familiar with going to the doctor's office and the doctor taking notes, but nowadays it's more often on a laptop and they're input somehow into a file and there are ways that your health can be tracked. How does artificial intelligence I impact that, if at all? Yeah, we're, we're at the nascence right now. And, you know, what our company does, and, and again, there, there are other companies that do this well, you know, good science always rises to the top, but uh, we're moving from, you know, a reactive um, area of medicine to a proactive. So, you know, our technology is processed about 80 million uh, patients, so one sixth the U.S. population. And so we have the ability to predict in the future, will a person get better or worse? And will there be an adverse event such as a hospitalization, uh, a heart attack, a stroke? And then be able to give the physician at the office two or three weeks beforehand the necessary information to prevent that hospitalization or that diabetic attack or that heart attack. So if I if I give you an example, you know, especially for rural health, if someone's driving from Columbus, Georgia to Augusta and they have a heart attack and let's say they're they're safe to be able to pull over, the their um, their chances of survival are, are are greatly diminished because they're in a rural community and being able to get to a, a hospital. What we do is we predict that heart attack three weeks out. And the physician, maybe their general practitioner or the cardiologist can get them in for the right tests and then for either a surgical or pharmacological uh, intervention. And so we then we get survival of that patient. So that's 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 real science fiction stuff that you're saying is now science fact, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Well, we were inspired by watching Star Trek and Star Wars and all that technology. Well, who right? wasn't? And Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's happening right now. I mean, for another thing, you know, one of our clients, we reduced their hospitalizations by, you know, 27% within 90 days. And, and, and that's awesome for, for the patient. But also from the payer perspective, maybe that be Medicare or Medicaid, that's a quarter of a billion dollars in savings. So, you know, this is real. How is that different if it is from DNA predictors? Yeah, and that's a really good point. And that's another data source. Um, you know, there, what you, there's an equation called um, environment times genotype, so how you live and then what your genetic capabilities are equals phenotype, what's exhibited or, you know, who we are. And DNA and um, your genetic background plays a role in that. So there's susceptibility for cancer or, or uh, cardiovascular disease. And then the environment that you, you live in, you know, either enhances that or, or mitigates that. So having that data as well in your, in your uh, medical history allows for those predictions to be much more precise. Dr. Severance McLaughlin is with us. He is a recognized expert in artificial intelligence, founder of DeLorean AI. Do you have a flux capacitor, by the way? Yeah, yeah actually, we, we do. There was a, <laughs> we uh, have that hopefully getting us to the future and coming back and uh, giving us that real information to, to save lives. 
There we go. I did want to get to the other side of this equation, which is, all right, somebody comes now to the doctor with artificial intelligence. We're down the road a little bit here, and the doctor says, oh, I'm looking at all the data that we have, and you're going to be probably dead in about three weeks, so let's not even bother. Or you know, there's something whether that happens with somebody is much, much more likely, for example, to suffer something, some kind of an affliction that um, father or mother had cancer or some other kind of problem. And as a result of that, their insurance will be adjusted accordingly. Talk about that issue. So that's a very real issue. Um, I have had chief medical officers from insurance companies say, you know, we don't want this technology because you know, they may not be with us in two years, so why would we want to pay for this? I mean, it's a very real issue. And I think that we need to stay strong with, you know, uh, pre-existing conditions and, and uh, you know, you can't be written off, right? We need to be able to take care of those individuals. But knowing those facts, right, and being able to predict that allows you to make choices for treatment modalities a lot earlier. And I'll give you an example. With with AI, we are able to to identify diagnoses such as chronic kidney disease five years earlier, and we can get people on treatment modalities that can keep them in that stage of the disease for 20 years, so that they may actually you know uh, what causes death is completely different. To another one of your points, hey you know you know you're you're gonna we predict you're gonna pass in in four months. That's a very real prediction that the medical community is asking so that they can change their treatment protocols to for end of life so that it's um, to ensure comfort and um, that they're not putting through the patients to unwanted um, uh, cases or whatnot. Yeah, I think that there, you know, there's always going to be a question of whether somebody wants to know exactly you know it's 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 one of those parlor games right if, if you knew yeah. if you could know when you were going to die what would you do with that information but in this particular case there's a difference between say narrowing the projection of life for an individual but also deciding to take that knowledge and have it affect the person's insurance or their personal life in other words now their their privacy in some ways is at risk it sounds like yeah, I, I don't. So, so I don't think the privacy is at risk because all that data is is available to the insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid already, right? Um, you know, a good physician is going to be able to tell this no matter what. I think what your point is in terms of do they get discriminated against because of that? I think that is something that we need to ensure that does not happen. But I would also argue that knowing beforehand and having that insight allows us to make better medical uh, decisions and choices uh, for for their care and then and in, in our technology extends life and and you know our tagline is more hugs right like one more hug with your grandmother or ten more hugs with your with your your elderly parents you know my, my last question for you is uh, having to do with technology because one of the things that is so much a part of the headline news these days is fraud waste abuse in the federal government in the case of social security for example let's not argue about the statistics but they are using almost ancient technology and in order to get something like what you're talking about to work on the federal government level it would seem to me it would require a massive investment in capital expenditure and technological advancement that is just certainly not part of the landscape in dc right now so you are correct about that the the federal government's way behind we know that for a fact you know private industry is is there they have the capability they are not being motivated by you know, Medicare Advantage by the insurance companies or Medicaid that's being administered through the insurance companies. Those insurance companies are not investing in this technology. Uh, we also know that, you know, Social Security, CMS, they, they don't have this. Um, I can tell you right now, give you the example of, of uh, dialysis. You know, if you turned our technology on, which would be less than $10 million, we could save you, you know, probably $20 billion um, within within 12 months. And it's not a hard lift, right? I, I would argue that the challenge with the federal government is that it's more of an art than a science to be able to, to deal with the federal government and and access uh, those those um, key stakeholders or the contracting process. And that's what's holding us back. The, the technology is available, and it's not it's not overly priced or uh, cost prohibitive. It's actually a, a you get an ROI. And I go one step further. A uh, return on investment or ROI. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, the return on this. And I, I go one step further in saying that 
if those technologies were were implemented, right, the federal government is spending what, one point one point two trillion on on CMS that we deserve as taxpayers to get value for our dollar. And when I say that, it means that are our patients, may they be Medicaid or Medicare, getting the the best treatment possible, meaning that when they go to the doctor, they don't have to go four or five times or whatnot. And and instead of fraud, waste, and abuse under the efficiency, ensuring that the, the, the top care is given and those top doctors are getting the most patients processed. And I think you'd actually get a, a huge health outcomes from that. So again, back to the dialysis, uh, example: one out of one out of every eleven people that go to the hospital for dialysis uh, don't don't come home. So if you can reduce that by twenty seven percent for a fraction of the cost, you know, you, again, you've delivered those hugs, but you've also delivered those dollars. And what about the people who would need to use this technology? Would there be new training required? Would there be new individuals required? What what's about your workforce? Yeah, I mean, I think it gives, you know, some of the workforces, you know, are decreasing, right? We don't have enough physicians and there's physician deserts. So one, the AI brings efficiency there so more patients can be uh, treated. And yeah, they have to be engaged, uh, at least with what we do. Uh, it takes us three months of uh, training and engagement, uh, nurses and physicians. Uh, in 2019, when we had founded the company, about 33% of physicians were, were pro-AI, and now we're seeing about 70%. So, so the physicians are now engaging this. It's, and I would, and I, the reason for that is I call it the Netscape effect. I, I'm, a, I'm a Gen X, so you know, in the early 2000s when the internet was happening, that, that Netscape, you could touch and feel it. Open AI and ChatGPT really have allowed civilian population um, to be able to touch and feel an AI and have confidence in it. And I think that acceptance, both by the patient and the physician, uh, is incredibly powerful. And, and, and the, the training portion is not a big lift from our experience to drive those, um, those efficiencies. It is a brave new world, and it is getting braver and newer all the time. Dr. Severance and McLaughlin, thank you for joining us on POTUS today. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I appreciate the time. Interesting conversation. Dr. Severance McLaughlin, a recognized expert in artificial intelligence, is the founder of DeLorean AI. You can actually find out more about the company with their website, DeLoreanAI.com. In a moment, we'll spend some time talking about the Supreme Court.